Today, everybody is talking about the fact that we live in one world. Because of globalization, we are all part of the same planet. They talk that way, but do they mean it? We should remind them that the words of the Declaration of Independence apply not only to people in this country, but also to people all over the world. People everywhere have the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when the government becomes destructive of that, then it is patriotic to dissent and to criticise, to do what we always praise and call heroic when we look upon the dissenters and critics in totalitarian countries who dare to speak out. And that was said by Howard Zinn. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And I'll be your host for the next hour. Now, what I'd like to do with today's broadcast, folks, is address some of the issues that people are writing to me about. I want to address how humanity has been hijacked, how our consciousness has been hijacked, how any real experience and connection we have to reality around us has been hijacked, and what steps may be taken to put us back on track and put us back to where we should be. A lot of people have been gaining some understanding of the law of mirroring and how reality will mirror back to you the emotional state you're in, and a lot of people are having difficulty manifesting the type of reality they want these days. And there's a reason for that, folks. And essentially it's based on the energetic state of the reality you are interacting with. Because the energetic state of reality around us has been vastly changed over the last few decades. Now very often on this show you've heard me talk about division. And how division is one of the main tools that is used to hold us back. And one of the main reasons why we never seem to be able to bring about any type of effective change. is because we live in such a divided society. And this may seem somewhat irrelevant at the moment in talking about how humanity has been hijacked, but really it is quite an important issue, folks. It's very much part of it because the hijacking is only able to occur, only able to perpetuate itself via the generally divided state of mankind. And it's important to see how pervasive this division is, folks, because when I say we live in a divided society, it isn't just that we live within a civilization which is divided simply by the social mechanism within the civilization, the different hierarchical extremes of the society, the racial differences, the economic differences and all of that sort of stuff, but it's also very much in the compartmentalized response we have to situations. For example, the different groups that we have speaking out against different problems, the groups that are speaking out against coal seam gas mining, the groups that are speaking out against the introduction of smart meters, the groups that are speaking out against the whaling, the groups that are speaking out against the refugee situation, animal rights activists, forestry activists. There's so many different issues, folks. And each one of these issues is a quite important problem in itself. But really, what I've been attempting to show to people is that all of these issues are simply symptoms of the one problem. That one problem being corruption in government. Essentially a corrupt system. I mean, the system itself is completely corrupt, folks. It isn't just corruption in government. It's an inherently dysfunctional system, and that is the problem. And I really believe that that's where the focus has to be because it isn't until we focus on the original problem, the issue that caused all of these symptoms to become manifest, that we're actually going to find a remedy to any of the symptoms that we're all attempting to address. And I'm not saying that people should stop speaking out against problems. We need to speak out against things, but we need to also do other things apart from speaking out against them. We only really need to speak out against them in order to bring about public awareness, but you can't expect to actually change anything by just speaking out against a certain issue. You see, you're never going to stop smart meters by speaking out against smart meters. You've got to look at the mechanism which has allowed smart meters to be introduced, and this comes back to legislation that's been put in place by governments. 
I mean, you could look at it other ways and say, oh, no, it's because of things that the electrical company is doing and new standards that they're setting up. But really, it's all combined, folks, because the electrical company can only do these things because it was privatised. Well, how did it become privatised? Well, that would be because of legislation and things that the government did which allowed this privatisation to occur. And ultimately, when you look at what smart meters are doing, folks, I actually believe that it goes back to human genetics. It goes back to the fact that we are electrical and electromagnetic beings, and we can be affected very much by the electromagnetic soup that we're swimming around in. So I think there's a lot more to it than a more efficient power company finding more efficient ways to milk you of your wealth. I think that's just something that is a byproduct of it. The whole financial system, folks, it's fiction anyway. So the financial reasons that people have for doing these things, I think it's just a smokescreen. I really think it's all part of a much bigger agenda. Of course, those working within such companies that are creating such electromagnetic devices may well be subject to financial motivation in order to do so because many of these people believe the system is real, they believe money is real, and so money provides them the incentive to do what they do. But on a larger scale, those who control these institutions at the top, those who are actually controlling the entire agenda, which is compartmentalised when viewed from a corporate level, these people really don't see money as a motivation, folks, because money is fiction. It's only those CEOs and those persons working within the corporations in general who view money as a motivation for what they do. But as I said, folks, I actually think there's a lot more to it than money. I believe that people really need to pay some serious attention to the transhumanist agenda. I think that the electromagnetic soup that we're swimming in and the damage that things such as smart meters and mobile phones and microwave technology in general is doing to the human organism, I think it's profound. I think that it's affecting us in so many ways that we're not aware of, and I really do believe there is a higher agenda to this. Because not only does it disconnect us from the natural frequencies of the planet and the natural frequencies that should exist all around us, it also provides a platform, a mechanism, if you will, by which we can be electromagnetically interfered with. And remember, folks, that everything you experience is electromagnetic. Every feeling, every taste, every smell, every thought, everything that you experience, everything that you are, is electromagnetic. You are essentially a frequency of consciousness that inhabits a biological vessel, and this frequency of consciousness is able to interact with the world around it by means of electromagnetism. Because, as I said, everything you experience is quite literally an electromagnetic frequency. Every touch, every smell, everything that you are. Every interaction that you have with the world that is outside of your body is experienced electromagnetically. That's how the information gets to your brain. That's how it travels around your body. That's how it travels up your nerves. That's how things work, folks. And we know that things can be affected via electromagnetic signals. Look at the remote control for your television, for example. And so we know that things can be operated remotely. And since you are an electromagnetic being, what makes you assume for one moment that you could not be interfered with remotely via the electromagnetic soup that you're swimming in? And this is where things such as genetic implants, RFID chips and microwaves become of great concern for their potential for misuse. And don't think that they wouldn't misuse these things, folks. Of course they would. Look at everything else the government is doing. Of course they would misuse these things. In fact, I would suggest that is even why they are being constructed. And I even think that the construction of such devices and the construction and the pursuit of such technology is really the product of a psychopathic mind because... I cannot see why any normal, rational human being who was wanting to experience humanity to the greatest of their potential and wanting to nurture the human creative spirit to the greatest of its potential and take mankind in a path whereby we could achieve all that we are capable of achieving, I don't see how a mind like this would even pursue such goals. 
And I truly do believe that the entire transhumanist agenda is about control. It's not about anything else. It's not about enhancing the human experience. It's not about improving human biology. I think such incredible steps have been undertaken in order to limit the potential of human biology as it is, that if we were simply allowed to live in a toxin-free environment and allowed to explore our consciousness and explore ourselves and explore our creative potential, then we could achieve amazing things. And I think that all of that has been limited and there is an attempt to replace it with technology that can be controlled by an outside source. And again, folks, if you really look at this rationally, you begin to come to the conclusion that such technology and such pursuits could only possibly be the product of a psychopathic mind. Really, folks, it's all about control. That's what the whole transhumanist agenda is about. That's what the whole electromagnetic control grid is all about. It's about control. And humankind is being controlled in so many ways, folks, very much biologically, through the introduction of genetically modified food. And don't think that this is not causing a real problem, because it is. It's causing a huge problem for the species, and not only for our species, but for all other species. You'll notice that insects and ants and animals won't eat genetically modified food, folks, because it's very, very bad for you. This is also what the huge seed banks, such as the one in Iceland, are all about as well, folks. They have made sure that they've preserved all of the natural and heritage seeds on the planet so that once this reality implodes, which is what it's going to do, and once all the life on this planet implodes, which is what it's going to do, due to the introduction of GM food, then they will be able to start again because they've still managed to preserve all of the old seed stocks. And this is the way GM food works, folks. I mean, eventually, because it's terminator seeds and it's infecting everything and these seeds cannot reproduce, eventually it will kill virtually all the life on the planet. All the flora and fauna just won't be able to cope with the genetic modification of the environment. And then we will be able to start afresh and plant what we want to be planted. This is how all-pervasive this controlling mind is, folks. This is how psychopathic these people are. They literally believe that they can do better than creation itself. They believe that mankind is the top of the universal food chain, and even God can't come close to what we can do ourselves through technology. This is what these mad scientists in control of all this mess actually believe, folks. People such as Ray Kurzweil who believe that the human biology is inefficient, that humankind is stunted, and that we need technology in order to enhance and improve ourselves. But of course what they're not taking into account is, as I said earlier, the fact that the reason humankind is stunted is because of the genetic and electromagnetic manipulation of our biology and of our environment in general. So really, looking for a technological way out of this situation is really putting the horse before the cart. We don't need to find a technological way out of it. What we need to do is to get rid of the toxins and pollutants and the technological influence on reality around us, because that's where the problem has been created to begin with. Finding a workable band-aid for a problem that we have created ourselves rather than simply fixing the problem is again not the act of a sane and rational mind. But that's simply the way these people think, folks, and that should be a little bit of a sign for people, I would think. Again, it just depends on your perspective, folks. The problem is that a lot of people have been sold transhumanism and they've been sold technology via the left brain education system that we're all subject to. That's one of its purposes. A lot of people within the modern scientific community and even a lot of people within everyday life within our societies really cannot conceive of the concept that human biology may be stunted and that we may be capable of much greater things that we may in fact have our own inner technology that we could harness if we were allowed to a lot of people find it very very disturbing to think about things like this and they don't see it as being anything that's possible because they can't find a textbook somewhere that talks about it from a modern scientific left-brain perspective. 
But really the modern scientific perspective, folks, this is an alternative view to a view that has been held by most of humanity for centuries. It is an alternative perspective, the same as modern scientific medicine is in fact alternative medicine to that which we have used for centuries. Very interesting the way the scientific and academic community have hijacked the meaning of the word alternative in as much as they have instilled within people the perspective that the modern scientific and academic methods are in fact the normal way to do things and that anything that thinks outside of that box that's been superimposed over human thinking is in fact alternative when the real truth of the matter actually lies in the opposite direction. And really, folks, what has modern alternative medicine, scientific medicine, actually achieved for humankind? And I know that when I say that, there are going to be a lot of people out there saying, oh, we've managed to rid the world of all sorts of diseases through vaccinations and all sorts of stuff, and we've managed to cure this and cure that, and we've extended the human lifespan and all sorts of things. But, folks, really, if you look at the graphs, you look at the figures, you'll find that none of the vaccinations actually eliminated anything, that all of the diseases that we created vaccines for, such as polio, were all on the decline anyway. And it really wasn't the vaccines that had anything to do with it. And if you really look at modern medicine, folks, well, I would suggest that the best way to really view it and to appraise it would be to compare it to natural medicine and what the state of the world was when we used natural medicines. And folks, all you've got to do is look at hospitals. I mean, a 100 years ago, 150 years ago, Hospitals were buildings where most of the beds were empty. It was a place that you would go to if you were seriously ill and you needed an operation or you were dying and you needed serious treatment, you would be taken to a hospital. But hospitals were mostly empty. Whereas modern hospitals, since the introduction of the modern scientific method, are places where it's almost impossible to get a bed. These are places that are overflowing with sick people. The world is in fact far, far sicker than what it was when we used to use natural medicines. And this is what the scientific method has done. See, the scientific method and natural medicine, again, folks, it's all about control. They're not really interested in healing you. What they're interested in doing is controlling you. And the telltale point here is that pretty well all of the modern scientific medicines that we're finding have been Substances that mimic that which is found in nature, or they've been able to isolate a, a specific compound that's found in nature, which is found to have properties that will cure certain diseases or will treat certain ailments. So what they do is they isolate this compound within any plant extract, and they create a scientific copy of it, and then they patent it so that they can sell it to you, rather than telling you to just go and eat the plant, because that way they can make money out of your sickness. And if they're feeding you GM food, which naturally impedes the body's ability to heal itself, then they're selling you sickness with the GM food and then they're selling you the compounds that they have isolated from nature in order to treat those sicknesses. And it's business, folks. It's all about commerce. It's not about making you well. It's about control. This is what the World Health Organization does, folks. It controls the state of world health. It doesn't mean it makes people healthy. It controls the state of their health. And it makes sure that people are working to complement the pharmaceutical industry and working to complement the certain commercial industries that surround the state of their health. And that's what it's all about. It's all about control, folks. Everything they do is about control. The issue really is helping people see that and helping people see the system for what it is, which is a very difficult thing. It's a very difficult hurdle to overcome because people are very much programmed by the television, very much programmed by the education system. They're trained to think within a certain box, and if you offer them a suggestion of anything which doesn't fit within the parameters of that box, they very often simply dismiss it offhand as being impossible. And it's the same with the system of control, because it's never mentioned on the television, it's never presented to them by reporters and by the mainstream media, then they think it's impossible for such a system to exist. They don't see the media for what it is. They don't see the government for what it is. They really don't see reality for what it is. And the most significant part about it, of course, is they don't see themselves for what they are. Because it's when you truly discover yourself that all of the barriers break down, all the mechanism becomes apparent and becomes clear before your eyes. 
as soon as you discover yourself. And it is this self-discovery which is also extremely beneficial in combating the systems of control that mankind in general is subject to. A lot of people find it very difficult, folks. They've become aware of the system and it just becomes depressing for them. They don't know how to really get around it. They don't know how to live their lives normally. They don't know how to go through day-to-day life knowing that the system is there. It is quite a shocking revelation for many people when they discover the systems of control that are all around us all the time. And as much as it is important for people to discover these systems and to be aware of these systems, it's also important for those who are presenting the information about these systems to the people to provide pathways to solution and pathways to remedy for people. Because it's one thing to say, well, look, you've got to discover yourself. All the changes need to come from within. But people need to have a practical approach to how to use this knowledge. Okay, I've discovered myself. Now, how do I apply it? How do I change the outer world by changing the inner world? And that's something that I want to get to in a minute, probably in the last half of the show. I want to talk about how we can view reality and how my view of reality anyway has changed the way I view things. And that's all I can offer you folks is my perspective. I can tell you what works for me and hopefully offer you steps of how to get to that point. But I can only really do things in my own way, and I can only offer you the perspective that I've got. I can't give you a clear-cut method and say, well, if you follow steps 1 through to 7, it's going to lead you where you need to go, because ultimately it is up to the individual. But I will be discussing some of that in the latter half of the show. Suffice to say for now that it is important to become aware of the control grid, but it's also important to be aware of yourself because it is in knowing yourself that you will discover the mechanism for dealing with the control grid and circumventing the systems that have been superimposed over our reality. The issue being that it works to a certain extent when applied to your personal reality, but in dealing with the bigger reality around us, well, that's going to take some effort folks because there are so many people who are still locked into the matrix and who simply cannot see the control grid for what it is and that I believe is our biggest hurdle breaking the programming of the general population and changing the general consensus of what reality should be changing the view that humankind has of themselves the way people limit their own potential by the limited view they hold of themselves and the limited view they hold of humanity in general. And that truly is the greatest challenge that the alternate research community faces, folks, is how to wake up the sheeple. I don't even like to call them sheeple, but unfortunately that's what most people are. They simply follow the leader. They simply follow the rules that they're given and the dictates of this inherently corrupt system. As I've often said, of course, you can't blame them for doing this because they're trained to believe that this is how reality works. The education system, one of its most basic foundations is the installation into people of the mechanism of authority. We are taught to respect authority at all costs. Everything we do in our scholastic life, right through to our business life, through to our day-to-day social life, We are taught that it is all about a respect for authority and that without this respect for authority, nothing would work, nothing would function. The whole system would fall apart. You must respect the chain of command. This is how the military works. This is how all good businesses work. And, folks, there's an important sign there because it's that respect for authority that maintains the mechanism. And the respect for authority is... Ridiculous to the extreme because ultimately nobody has any authority over anybody else. The entire authoritarian regime is simply fiction. It's a fictional construct. It was created simply to maintain the status quo. That's its whole purpose. But nobody has any authority over you, my friends. You are a completely unique, beautiful expression of creation. And you have just as much right to the abundance of this earth as anybody else. And nobody has the authority to prevent you from accessing that abundance. Nobody has the authority to prevent you from being yourself to your fullest potential. 
of expanding your consciousness to its fullest potential, of expressing your art and the art of your life to its fullest potential. No one has the authority to do this and to prevent you from being all that you can be. But what has happened is we have allowed the construction around us of a fictional system that we have been taught to believe is real. And this is the world that most of society lives in. They live in a world steeped in authority, a world wholly constructed of the opinions of others that they have taken on and they have allowed to become their own reality. That's one of the biggest problems we face because when you question this and when you cause people to question the reality around them, it can be very, very confrontational for people. Because very often what people are experiencing as a reality is a construct that they've got from somebody else. It isn't something that they've actually experienced on their own. It's something that they've got from books or something that they've been taught to believe is possible because it exists within certain parameters of science. And this is what you're very often waking people up to when you wake them up. You very often are suggesting to people that everything they thought was real about this world was actually wrong and that every moment of their life up to that point has been completely meaningless. And this is very confrontational. This is a huge moment of awareness with people, and it can be taken very many ways. Some people find it an incredibly uplifting and freeing moment of their lives, and some people find it to be a very depressing and very fearful moment of their lives, because suddenly their reality falls away from beneath their feet. And once you wake up, it's very difficult to go back to sleep. So it's important to be aware of how you're bringing this type of information to people. And it's important to be aware of the type of programming they've been subject to. And I believe that the best way to wake people up from this slumber that we are collectively in as a species is to lead by example in all that you do, to show people that there is a better way, not just tell them that the world is corrupt, but to literally show them that there is another way of doing things and to point out the obvious to them in as calm and concise a manner as possible. That's the method that I've used anyway. But it is a lot to be feared, folks. There is a huge control grid being put in place around us. I can understand why a lot of people are fearful when they present the information to the people at large. But again, folks, I see it all as opportunity. And we'll discuss some of these opportunities after the break because I think we are now at break time, folks. So I'll have to leave it there for now. It's a pleasure having your company with me on the air today. And I'll speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, so there is no underestimating the electromagnetic control grid that is around us. There is no underestimating the amount of smog that we are swimming in all day. And a lot of this smog is why many people are having so much difficulty with their emotions lately. It's why people are having so much difficulty connecting to source lately. Because we are quite literally swimming in a sea of electromagnetic soup. And this is not just due to mobile phone technology and wireless technology that's around us. It's also due to aerial spraying because there is an electromagnetic flux that has been created in the atmosphere due to the emissions that are coming from a modern aircraft. A lot of people look at chemtrails and they they view the topic as very, very fringe theory. They view it as disinformation, many people. But the research that I have done has caused me to believe that the phenomena of chemtrails is real and that there are specific compounds that are being sprayed across the planet. These chemtrails are a multi-platform delivery system for all types of things, One of their purposes is to create an electromagnetic flux in the atmosphere, which makes it possible for electromagnetic waves and signals to be carried great distances across the Earth. And it also creates kind of an electromagnetic blanket around people that can be very easily manipulated. And this is why a lot of people are having difficulty with manifestation. This is why a lot of people are having difficulty with the law of mirroring at the moment, because they're finding it very difficult to actually connect to reality around them due to the electromagnetic pollution that they are forced to endure because we are all swimming in a sea of electromagnetic pollution virtually all the time. In fact, I'm quite lucky where I'm living, folks, because out of all the places in the area that I live, my place appears to be the only one that doesn't 
receive cell phone signals. People's cell phones don't work when they come to visit me, which is really good. It's a great place to be, actually, because it's a little pocket and it feels very, very clear where I'm living. All the people that come to visit me have commented on how clear the energy is here. I actually have people who come up to visit me and they stay for a night or two sometimes because they are able to reconnect with source, reconnect with the energy, reconnect with the earth while they are here because they are free of any electromagnetic interference. So it is a real stroke of luck in this place that I happen to live in, folks, although I wonder about luck these days. Everything just seems to be rather synchronistic for me. And when I think about it, of course, I would move into a place where you wouldn't receive any wireless signal. It just seems to be the way my life works. And I don't even question these things anymore, folks. I found that reality always seems to work out just the way it's supposed to. But getting back to reality, it's actually my understanding of reality, which has been a huge pillar of strength for me in my struggle against this system and in my ability to maintain a positive energetic state and maintain the fight and maintain the struggle and maintain my demeanor and not feel overwhelmed by the system sometimes. I mean, a lot of people do find it quite overwhelming. But I have a particular understanding of reality, which I've spoken about many times on the air, but I'm going to reiterate it in a bit of a nutshell for you here today, just for those people, those new listeners who have been sending me emails, who are finding it very difficult to stay connected to source and are finding it very difficult to maintain their energy levels while being subject to the electromagnetic soup that they are forced to swim in within the parameters of cities and places like this. Because, as I said, electromagnetism really does affect us in extremely adverse ways. But personally, I feel that I am able to circumvent this type of electromagnetic interference by just maintaining a very, very pure connection inside me, a connection to source that's always there. And it also helps to be very aware of what you're thinking, to be very aware of how you are interacting with other people, what your emotional state towards these people is. And if you are annoyed with someone, then to really look at yourself, look at what's caused you to be annoyed with that person. Because very often you'll find it is because that person has not lived up to certain parameters that you yourself have created for them. I mean, it's not always this way. Very often there'll be people who actually do go out of their way to hurt other people. But such isn't always the case, folks. And very often we are finding that people are failing to live up to parameters that we have constructed for them, often without their consent or even their knowledge. And, folks, we do this because we get disconnected and so we look for energy in other people. And we do that by constructing certain parameters that we believe these people should operate in and when they don't, we get annoyed about it and really we have no right to do that because really by doing that all we are doing is exercising a right of ownership a right of jurisdiction over somebody else which we have no right to do again folks and as always it's simply a matter of perspective but really when you look at it folks all demands we make of others and all claims that we make over others these are all our choice to exercise a right of ownership or claim jurisdiction over another person. Really, it all comes down to jurisdiction, doesn't it? I mean, that's one way of looking at it anyway. I mean, if you are claiming you have the right to control the actions of your spouse, for example, then you would be claiming that you have jurisdiction over your spouse. When really you don't, you don't have jurisdiction over anybody but yourself. And it's important to also recognize that nobody else has jurisdiction over you. And that's really the best way to conduct a relationship with anybody, folks. Allow yourself to stay on your path, but always allow your partner to stay on their path as well. And you should always be operating in a manner in which your path complements their path. And your path, though being unique to yourself, also complements their path and helps your spouse become all that they could possibly be because why would you want anything less than that for the person that you love and to me that's what a relationship would be 
But look, getting back to reality and my understanding of reality, you've often heard me talk about the measurement problem on the show, folks. You've often heard me talk about the nature of atoms and how a scientist cannot measure an atom until he actually goes to measure it because the electrons that revolve around the nucleus are infinite. They exist everywhere at once. And it isn't until the scientist attempts to measure the atom that the electrons make the choice, the conscious choice, to be in one particular spot so that the scientist can measure the atom. And thereby we see an example that we create matter by our observation of matter. Essentially, we create matter and we believe matter should behave in a certain way due to our belief that the matter is there and due to our belief that it should behave according to certain parameters. And this is called the measurement problem, folks. And when you really think about that basic concept, and really, folks, this is how it's explained by science, and when you think about that and realize that atoms are the building blocks of all matter, all reality, and atoms are the building blocks of Newtonian physics, and atoms are something that science has yet to understand, then you begin to see what I'm getting at here, and you begin to see how profoundly different reality is to what our mainstream education system teaches us. Even though this is part of Newtonian physics, they just look at this and they call it an oddity. But really, folks, it's utterly profound that this should be how reality works. Now, couple that with the understanding that there have been studies which have shown that your consciousness is not local to your body. It actually exists outside in the field and that you download a certain frequency. And this has been correlated through studies that have been conducted on organ donor recipients who have begun to take on some of the characteristics of the donor once they receive the organ. It isn't like the organ had memory and they started experiencing some of the memories of the donor, although that has happened. But the organ actually contained the frequency of the donor, and that started to interact with the frequency of the recipient, whereby the recipient would start to crave certain foods that the donor liked, would start to enjoy certain music that the donor liked, and certain tastes in art that the donor had, that the recipient did not have previously. And these are not genetic memories. This is quite literally someone else's personality being downloaded into that body which received the organ because the body is essentially a biological computer tuned to a specific frequency that exists in the field outside of the body. And once an organ from another person is placed inside that body, then that organ is tuned to a different frequency. So it starts downloading parts of the person. Of course, it doesn't download as much as the recipient because there's far more organs, far more tissue, far more biology and genetics involved. And when you look at the work of people such as Bruce Lipton and you begin to understand that cells are actually controlled by their environment, genetics are controlled by their environment, and that everything operates electromagnetically, then you begin to see a larger picture. Couple that again with the work that's been done on the electric universe and you begin to see that everything is electric and everything is electromagnetic and of course this is how consciousness works and this is how the human body works and it makes perfect sense for it to work that way. In fact, when you really begin to think about it, you begin to wonder how else could it possibly work. And this is a really significant understanding, folks, because what you begin to see is that the universe is an energetic universe, that everything that exists in all of reality is made up of different frequencies of energy, different frequencies of light and sound. That's it, folks. Photon light and phonon sound. That makes up all of creation. And you begin to understand that as was so eloquently said in the Four Agreements, it isn't that the stars create the light, it's that the light creates the stars. And then you begin to understand the difference between what the Native Americans call the Tanal and the Nahual, which is the light and the dark, the matter between the light. And you begin to understand that empty space isn't empty, it's full of energy, the energetic stuff, the fibres, the strands, the frequencies of energy, the unformed stuff of creation itself. That is what is in the space. 
And then it dawns on you that it is a space that is real. That is the real stuff. The real fabric of reality is the space. And that all matter is, is divisions in space based on the perception and the understandings and the belief of that which is observing the matter. And you begin to look at this, folks, and it gives you a completely different understanding of reality and how you interact with reality and what you are actually connected to. The fact that you are literally made of energy. This is profound, folks. When you start looking at this and you start thinking about this and you start thinking about your day-to-day life and the way you interact with reality around you, then the mere fact that you exist, the mere fact that you are sitting in a chair right now or driving your car or wherever you happen to be, you're tuned into your computer or to your mobile phone or however you get the information, and you're sitting here listening to me talk, and you can look up and look around you and see the room and see reality and experience yourself, see your body, see the chair that you're sitting on, experience interaction with other people. This is absolutely incredible. This is absolutely amazing that we could have the type of reality that we have. It's absolutely incredible. And this understanding causes me to basically live my life in a constant state of amazement. And this is just how it is for me. I mean, I honestly can't remember the last time I had a bad day. I really can't. I can't remember the last time I was annoyed with anybody. Sure, I mean, I get frustrated. I get annoyed at the powers that be for what they're doing to the planet. But I don't get annoyed or upset with people around me on an everyday basis. I mean, people that you know you meet in the shop or people you meet down the street or some of your friends who might act in a way that you don't perceive to be beneficial or whatever judgment you want to put on it. You know, I just don't remember the last time I actually got upset with anybody. I mean, like I said, sure, I get annoyed with the ruling elite for what they're doing, but I don't hate them for it. I just get frustrated with it, so I do what I do with the radio show. I get annoyed with them, sure, but I find that annoyance to be motivational. But I don't get annoyed with anybody and just sit there and brood about it. I'm still in a state of amazement because I know how simple it would be to fix the problem. I know how simple it would be to change reality. You know, the world is only really getting worse because everyone believes it's getting worse. That's how it works. There's a film I put out in 2010, I think it was, called The Awakening. And I explained to people how when you can control the mind of enough of the population, then you can get the population to create any reality you want to create. And that is a lot of what this alternate research community and so-called truth community is doing. They're creating a totalitarian police state by their belief that that's what the world is. Because everything's a product of imagination, folks. And these people are imagining this world and they're sitting there online and they're speaking out about it and speaking out about it and yelling and screaming and pointing the finger, but they're not actually participating in the physical world around them to do anything to prevent the police state from being created. And because they're being so vocal online, then the powers that be are getting extremely worried and so they're ramping up security and doing things like we just caught the NSA doing and all the countries that are working with them. They're doing all this sort of stuff because they're so scared because people are screaming out about how corrupt the system is. But nobody's really participating in doing anything about it. Nobody is really offering solutions to the situation. And that's all we need, folks. We need solutions. And what are the solutions? Well, folks, again, the solution is you. The solution is yourself. The solution is knowing who and what you are. Being a good person in all that you do connecting with the people around you and building strong communal ties. That really is the solution. I know it's hard. We're having a hard time where I live at the moment. It's very difficult to connect with the neighbours in any real way. I've tried a couple of times, but it's very difficult to do because people are very much locked into their own version of reality and they're not really prepared to think outside of the box. This is, of course, because everyone is struggling via the imposition of the economic model over reality. This is how it works, folks. But really, it's getting to a stage where people, even people within the mainstream, people that are very much locked within the matrix, are beginning to see the fictional nature of the economic model, and they're beginning to see that the world could be very different from the way it is at the moment. 
Unfortunately, they're seeing it because their world is falling apart around them because of the ever-mounting bills and ever-mounting debts. And so this is, in many ways, bringing the community together as well. So there's probably a good side to it in some ways. But it's just a shame that that's what it's taking to get people to wake up to the fact that they are living within a very, very cleverly constructed control grid that really does not have humanity's best interests at heart. And folks, when I say much of the alternate research community is literally creating this control grid and creating this police state themselves, it's because these are people who are telling you that there is a real problem, but they're not offering you any solutions. Or if they are attempting solutions, it's always controlled opposition sort of solutions like marches and different movements that will be created to address a certain symptom of the problem, but it will always address the symptom within the legal parameters. So it's never really addressing the actual problem, and it's always limiting itself by operating within the legal parameters constructed by the system. And we're really not going to find remedy until we step above all that, folks. That's why I've harped on that for the last six years about how your relationship with government is quite literally a trust agreement, blah, blah, blah. It's a breach of trust. I mean, I've gone through it so many times. But I truly do believe that that is the only place remedy is going to be found. And this is why I've harped on so much about community and about uniting your community and about putting down the barriers you have and the stuff you have with other people. Get over the differences that you have because most of these differences are differences you've created yourself. You've created parameters around people. You've wanted them to act in certain ways according to the parameters you've constructed for them. They haven't done so, and so you've created stuff that you now cling on to, and that's the way you live your life. A lot of people are like this, like most of society is like this, folks. We've all got stuff with other people, stuff with the people around us due to preconceived notions that we constructed ourselves on how these people should act. And we need to get over this because it's not helping anything. All it's doing is perpetuating the problem. But again, folks, it's programming. So that's why I can say all this, and I'm not hard on anybody for having these preconceived concepts, and I'm not hard on anybody for having these ideas about other people because I can understand that this society is, is designed to program these sort of notions within people. So there's no good me criticising people for thinking this way. I just have to understand that they've been programmed to think this way and offer them suggestions of how to maybe think outside of that little box they've constructed for themselves. The hard part is dealing with people's egos because it's their egos that prevent them from ever seeing that there's been any box constructed in the first place. That's a lot of the problem, folks, is that when you attempt to get people to think outside of the box, their ego won't let them believe that there is a box there because their ego will tell them that anybody who suggests that they may be wrong on anything about the way they think, well, they need to take that as a personal attack against themselves. And again, folks, this is a pre-programmed response that's been constructed by the system in order to protect the system. One thing I'll say for the system, folks, it seems to have thought of all possibilities and does a very good job of circumventing people's thought patterns at every opportunity. Suffice to say in all of this, folks, that I just don't get annoyed with people anymore because I don't have any stake in the outcome of what anybody does. There are certain plans that I make and certain things that I would like to happen sometimes, and if they don't, well... That's just because they didn't. I don't have any stake in the outcome. I don't have any judgment for what people may do. I follow synchronicity in my life, and that's just the way I live my life. If things want to happen, then synchronicity makes sure they do. If they don't want to happen, if it isn't an organic process that doesn't just unfold, then I do something else. And so I don't have any stress in my life. I don't expect people to perform in any way. I just want people to find themselves, and I enjoy seeing people find themselves. I enjoy seeing people around me happy. 
I really do. I don't believe I have any hold or control or jurisdiction over anybody. And I also don't believe anybody has any over me. I just find life fascinating. I find people around me fascinating. I even find people who have fights and arguments and disagreements with each other fascinating. I find it fascinating that they can actually find something to fight about. Because to me, it's all a disconnection from source, a disconnection from reality. I find that people tend to harvest energy from those closest to themselves because they are disconnected from themselves and they become self-absorbed and they start looking for energy in others. I just don't do that, folks. I think reality is something different to that. And I just find the whole thing incredibly fascinating. And so that's the way I live my life. And I do what I do on these radio shows. I speak out with the voice that I have and say the things I do simply because I think it needs to be done. I think someone has to do it. I don't think we can allow human consciousness to simply continue down the path it's currently going because I think that path will ultimately lead to the destruction of mankind and the destruction of this reality, the destruction of our planet. And I can't sit idly by and simply allow that to happen. And that's why I do what I do. But suffice to say, folks, that there are a lot of systems in place that have hijacked the human experience and hijacked every part of our consciousness. But in all of this, it's provided us with the opportunity we need to address the situation, folks, and that is the important thing to pay attention to. Well, folks, we're almost at the end of this show here again. I have sorted out donations on the website again too, folks. You can make a donation now, and if you feel like it, please, it would be greatly appreciated at this moment in time. There is a link there and to an email address to send a smile at live.com. There's hyphens in there, send hyphen a hyphen smile at live.com. You'll see a link there on the website. You can make donations to that foundation at the moment. They are handling donations for me while I set up a Crow House Foundation that will handle donations from that point onwards. And again, folks, due to changes in PayPal, there isn't actually a donate button on the website, but there is an email that's listed there that you can use to make donations via PayPal. Again, this is due to changes in PayPal. It's not easy to access a donate button with the new format, but we're working on it. And so I'll keep you posted on that one. It's just a little bit difficult at the moment. You can't just click donate. You actually have to go to your PayPal and and specify the email that you wish to send the donation to. And so that's a little bit of a hassle for people, and I apologize that, but it's the best I can do at the moment, and your donation is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much to anybody who does make one. And to all those people who have sent me contacts regarding help with the television program for David Icke's TV station, The People's Voice, I will answer the emails, folks, and it's been great to receive the response that I have. Keep it coming, though. If you're someone out there who believes you can help with the television production and have ideas for the show or anything like that, don't hesitate to get in contact with me. We want to get as many ideas on the table as possible. And the people's voice really is about the people's voice. It's about you folks. So make sure you get involved with this because I really believe in what David's doing. I think that we can reach a large number of people with this television station he's opening. And I think it could be something that may even turn the tide in our favour, folks. So please do get involved. The people's voice will not be the people's voice without the participation of the people. So please do get involved, folks. But look, that is it for me. I'm completely out of time now. Thank you to anybody who has ever sent me a kind email. Thank you to anybody who has ever helped with the website. It's greatly needed and greatly appreciated. Thank you for continuing to listen to the show and for the support that you've shown me over the years. But that is it for me, folks. I'm completely out of time. I hope you got something from the show today, and I will look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take good care until then. In La Cash.